idea of who he is, what he believes, what he does. That's about all I'm going to say on that. Here's an interesting story out of, this is out of flashtraffic.com. This is Joel Rosenberg's blog. It says, amidst Iran and Syria crisis, Netanyahu holds fourth Bible study session with Jewish scholars. Yeah, I'm not going to read this whole story. In fact, I'm not going to read it at all. But here is a leader of a country who holds a Bible study with his, his Congress, his Knesset, his leaders. He holds a Bible study. Says he's gotten very interested in the Bible lately. You know, I sure hope he gets a little bit to the right of Malachi and reads some of that New Testament. Um, I know a lot of Jewish people like to stay in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, plus Isaiah and the Psalms and Proverbs, Ezekiel. Um, hopefully he'll, he'll open up to uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, get into those and study those as well. But isn't it refreshing to hear a world leader, someone running a country, holding Bible studies? Ah, wouldn't it be so awesome to have a God-fearing president in America that would do the same, instead of mocking the Bible and making fun of it, and making fun of those who follow after it, while he praises the Quran? Hmm. It's like backwards world we're living in. Here's a story out of Religious Today, Religion Today headlines. Damascus pastor says 40% of his congregation has fled the country. A pastor in Damascus paints a sad picture of the situation in the Syrian capital, Charisma News reports. The situation is very grim, said Pastor Edward. There's a deep sadness and much stress and anxiety. According to the pastor, approximately 40% of the members of his church have left the country since the civil war in Syria started two and a half years ago. Everybody calls it civil war except for Bashar Assad. I'm just curious what it really is now. I thought for sure it was a civil war. Um, <clears throat> he said it's the reality churches in Syria now face. People that have financial means and contacts abroad have left the war-torn country. He knows in his church some members are still waiting for the opportunity to leave Syria. He says it seems there's no end in sight. Christians are like all other people, concerned for their safety and the future of their children. The income in Damascus is worth less and less as the Syrian pound lost 75% of its value which has caused huge inflation. People are suffering economically and they're traumatized emotionally. Let me just reiterate, people in Syria need our prayers, they need our help. We need to do what we can. Here's a story out of the Washington Examiner. It's a poll. It says 57% believe in the devil, 72% for blacks, and 61% for women. A majority of Americans believe in the devil, especially blacks and women, according to this poll about exorcism. Um, <clears throat> Republicans said the devil exists more than Democrats, 65% to 55%. Uh, what else did it say? It's mostly a Christian fear. While 8 in 10 Christians believe in the devil, only 25% of Muslims and 17% of Jews do. Really? Because when you mention the fact that Muhammad was tricked by the devil in that dark cave that was really the devil in disguise, all Muslims will respond to me with, oh no, they, they talk about running from the devil or fearing the devil. Uh, what you do about the devil. But this says only 25% of Muslims believe in the devil. Hmm. Isn't it interesting? That he's actually the one they serve. Hmm. Are you wearing the full armor of God? We're getting right into the word today. Let's go to... Uh, where are we going? Let's go to Ephesians 6. Verses 10 through 18, you know this passage. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers and the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness 
in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Therefore, stand, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This is probably the Bible's most complete and comprehensive teaching about the resources that believers have to overcome evil and the devil and the enemy. You know, there's spiritual forces lurking behind all these conflicts and trials and tribulations and temptations that come our way. So, you shouldn't attack the people that are manipulated by evil, but focus directly on the evil itself, the one causing the evil, the one directing it. Rely on truth of God's word. Stand on his promises. You've got faith and there's power in your testimony. There's wisdom in God's word and there's power of prayer. We have so many weapons against this evil that comes against us. So when all these things are mobilized, evil succumbs. God wins and you win. The devil will flee when you stand on the promises of God. You know, there's a lot of stress in the world today. I, I've noticed it's everywhere. Everywhere. There's a lot of stress. You know, God has a stress remover. Stress is a, it, it's a killer. We can't get away from it. We're surrounded with all kinds of stressful situations in our daily lives. The question is, how are we going to handle it? How do you handle it? You know, a lot of people turn to alcohol and drugs and medication, sex, gambling, money, stuff, things, but none of that stuff brings relief from stress. They might be a temporary method, but none of these are really truly effective. I think the ultimate solution only comes from God, and He gives freely to everyone who asks. I, I, I know this works myself because I've, I've experienced it many times, actually quite a lot lately. Um, sometimes you just have to stop. You just have to stop and recognize what's causing the stress, what's underlying the stress. Jesus experienced stress to the point of sweating blood, but he knew exactly how to deal with it. You know, on one occasion, he, after feeding a multitude of 5,000 people, Jesus sent his disciples away in the boat, and then he went up in the mountain by himself to pray. Matthew 14. Went up in the mountain by himself. Seeking solitude with his Father was something Jesus did quite frequently. It's something we should also do, especially after some type of stressful situation. We see the Apostle Paul did the same thing. You know, when he was saved, he, he, he headed to Arabia to seek solitude with God, right? I think some of the most valuable time we can have is time spent alone with God. You know, spending time alone with God helps to set us free from stress. Now, uh, when you get isolated alone with God, it's not the same as loneliness. You know, solitude's a choice to be alone, so we voluntarily separate ourselves from others. But loneliness is that emptiness that results from feeling disconnected from other people. Uh, a sense of not belonging or, or, or being alone. But the purpose of solitude is to commune with God, where it's just you and Him. You're not, you're not speaking things in front of someone else, like in a way to impress them, or to show them how righteous you are, or something like that. It's just you and God. You know, get, get in a quiet place. If you can't climb up on top of a mountain, or be alone in some forest, or be out in the middle of a lake, or an ocean, and a boat, Go in your closet. You know, go go in a, a room no one uses. Get alone. Find some time. You know, the goal is not to study the Bible or, or to come to God with this laundry list of things you want, but simply to be with Him, to commune with Him, to talk to Him. That, that's when our stress is broken. That's when our tension goes away. Solitude teaches us how to deal with some of the stress that comes in our life. 
you know, the Lord wants us to be alone with Him for, for a couple of reasons. Number one is for a relationship. He wants a relationship with us. He created us in His image because He wanted to have a relationship with us for all eternity. Genesis 1.26 you know, nothing else in God's creation has this privilege of being made in His image. Think of all the millions of animals and birds and fish and bugs and insects and other creatures on this earth. Only man was made in the image of God. And it's not because God has two arms, two hands, you know, two eyes. The Bible says God is spirit. But Father, Son, Holy Ghost... And these three are one, 1 John 5, verse 7 tells us. We have a mind, a body, and a spirit. He's three parts. We're three parts. It goes much deeper than most people think. But, I mean, God loves us so much, He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for us, to break that barrier of sin that separates us from God, so that we can have fellowship with Him through the work that Christ did on the cross. But so many Christians don't seem to have time for God these days. Yes, we're busy. And yes, life is stressful. But you have to have your priorities in order. God should come first. God's up here. Sadly, so many people put God down at the bottom only after they've taken care of everything else. We need to restructure our priorities. Another reason is because it's preparation. You know, when we get alone with God, that's preparing us for the days ahead. You know, that uh, that's why we should be beginning every morning with time alone with God. You know, even if it's just a few minutes while you wake up, you're laying in bed, and you, you know, maybe looking up the ceiling, say, God, thank you for this day. Thank you that I woke up today. <laughs> Use me today for your glory. You know, ask him. Say, put someone in my path today that needs to hear the good news of the gospel of Christ. You know, reading the Bible and spending time in prayer are very important, but the purpose of solitude is to experience God's presence. To be still and know that He is God. To listen for that still, small voice. He can reveal Himself to you in some very incredible ways. How do we experience this kind of solitude? Well, open God's Word. Focus on Him. Eliminate distractions. You know, some of the benefits... Of, of this alone time it, it helps to make our days more fruitful we're able to accomplish more when we start out with him when we're based on his word when we're grounded when we build upon the rock that is Jesus Christ it, it repairs damage you know after a long hard day when you just can't seem to take it anymore and you're shouting Calgon take me away <laughs> God will refuel you. He, he will re-energize you. He'll, he'll help you with the troubles, the anxieties that you feel. He equips us to face the tough days. Time alone with the Lord will help you start your day right, give you confidence and assurance of His presence. It, it, it might create a surprising moment. He may unexpectedly answer a prayer you've had. It helps to strip us of pride. In God's presence, we recognize His holiness, His perfection, His power. And we understand how extremely lowly we truly are. It protects our health. You know, stress affects our bodies, damages our health. So, when we have this solitude with the Lord, it releases our anxiety so we don't have to suffer. It makes a difference in our relationships. You know, when we've released our stress with God, our relationships with others improve. You know, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. The second greatest commandment is like it, to love others as yourself. Love God, love others. That's what we do. It gives us peace and joy. It gives us a greater strength from the Lord. When you're grounded in the truth of God's Word, you feel like you can take on anything. It produces a greater trust of God in our lives. And, and it develops a closer relationship so we can walk more closely with Him. So how do you normally handle stress? Open up the fridge, have a cold beer, glass of wine, bubble bath. <laughs> Next time, have some alone time with God. See what happens. Luke 15 verse 2 says, This man receiveth sinners. This man receiveth sinners. Now we understand.